Hello and welcome to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. I'm Richard Moore and I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello Richard. Daniel Freib. Hi chaps. Welcome back, gang. Good to be back together, isn't it, Daniel? Yes, yes, yeah, okay. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis, we've got the big talking points covered. <laughs> Lionel, where are we? Well, we're in our what is becoming our regular... Um, post-Ride London Classic podcast venue, the Clarence in Dover Street. We actually came here last year and decided it was too noisy and we ended up recording our podcast on a pavement, if you remember, Richard. But this year we're stood outside having a post-race beer. Um, Not sure. Outside the Ritz. Just outside the Ritz, yeah, just off off Piccadilly here. And next door to Mahiki. I'm sure you've been to Mahiki, Lionel, no? Famous haunt of um, Prince William, Prince Harry. And Usain Bolt this week. Yes. I think, Correct. Daniel, you have elevated ideas of the sort of places I hang out. But. Well, there's a reason why we're in the heart of London, and that is that we were at the Ride at London, Prudential Ride London, London Surrey Classic. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was a it, bit it, of a it's mouthful. It's catchy, isn't it? That's yeah. a bit of a mouthful. And also the Women's Grand Prix, Prudential Women's Grand Prix, um, which was last night in, in central London. So, yeah... Um, yeah, it was it was a good race today. It was won by Adam Blythe, the great enigma of uh, British and perhaps even world cycling, who has uh, joined the the British team this year. NFTO, I think I got that right. NFTO, uh, having previously been with BMC. Now he was on a quite a lucrative contract with BMC. I believe he was released a year early from that contract. Um, had joined at the same time as Philip Gilbert. Philip Gilbert was very active in the race today. Um, tried to get away with about 14 kilometres to go from the little, the little breakaway and, uh, and almost did but was brought back, it came to a sprint everybody was looking at Blythe who's a very strong sprinter but he, got, he caught them on the hop didn't he, he jumped very early I think about 300 metres to go um, he was fifth man in the, in the break uh, Ben Swift was just in front of him most people would have said it was between those two in that sprint and uh, Blythe just got them all napping a little bit and, and jumped and, and took a, a very uh, a very well earned victory uh, and I think he said afterwards that it was a victory that he hopes will earn him a contract uh, back in the big time because NFTO have really been racing this year uh, a lot of tour series domestic races here in Great Britain and um, he wants to get back in the in the big pond doesn't he Lionel? Yeah he does although when I spoke to Philippe Gilbert, uh, Philippe Gilbert former world champion of course one of the biggest names in cycling um, very good friends with Adam Blythe when they were together at BMC and um, I did ask Philippe Gilbert after the race whether he felt Blythe was ready to return to the World Tour and he sort of said well yes but it's whether he wants to do that it, and he's not certain that he wants to do that but obviously Blythe has given um, a fairly strong indication that he would like to step back up to that level by the sound of it. When he says wants to do that I suspect what he means is um, is he prepared to make the sacrifices necessary yeah. to l- uh, race that level because I think an issue with Adam Blythe over the years has been um, that he has not always been uh, entirely focused on being a professional bike rider. I think you would agree with that, Daniel. Um, yeah, that has you know fairly or unfairly been said about him in the past. And if you look at the pattern of his results, um, he's obviously someone who can put out a result when he needs one. He, he traditionally goes well in around late September, even early October time. Circuit franco belge has always gone well in, which is one of the last races of the season. And, um, you know, to earn himself a contract for the following year. And like I say, he's obviously someone with talent. He's fast. He can, he can get over a climb. He's definitely got the ability to ride in the World Tour. But, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. There are a lot of riders there today, perhaps not the strongest well, not a, a stronger field as the organisers would have liked today, but it was an interesting snapshot. There were a lot of guys there um, for whom this was a big showcase today. I chatted to Matt Bramier, who, of course, used to ride for Omega Pharma Quick Step. Um, were they called that then? A couple of years ago, he rode for HTC Columbia as well in the final year of that team. And he's now riding for the Baku Cycling Project. And he was desperately disappointed today because that team rides a fairly modest program and he saw today as a massive opportunity and he had a problem with his shoe and he was he was very um, frustrated that the team car had taken about but well, he said it was 50 kilometers to actually get him a new shoe and he felt he said that he felt good and you know t- today was one of the only real sort of top level races that that team does all season he feels that he's blown his chance you mentioned at the start there, Richard, about Adam Blythe, just to, to return to today's winner. Um, 
you called him an enigma and I think even going back to his days on the British Cycling Academy he was a quite a, a frustrating character for Rod Ellingworth to deal with I remember being at the Ghent Six Day in I think 2007 could have could have been 2008 struggling to remember which year it was it was 2007 Lionel because he won that with Peter Kenyuk that's right and I was at the Rotterdam 60 a few weeks later and um, Blythe and Kenyuk had been down to ride that together and it was uh, Kenyuk and Ben Swift who turned up and it was just at that time when Adam Blythe had left the British Cycling Academy there were there were some disciplinary issues apparently at the time now he well, his version of the story is that he left the cycling academy I'm not sure what exactly happened there yeah I think there was a frustration certainly from Rod Ellingworth that Blythe was talented but he wouldn't apply himself to perhaps the discipline that he was that Rod Ellingworth was trying to lay down I mean there was a lot of classroom work where they were trying to learn teach the riders Italian or and a, uh, perhaps another language I'm not sure that maybe they did some French lessons as well but I'm not terribly sure from what I gather I'm not sure that Blythe was the greatest student in the classroom perhaps wasn't one of the ones that was uh, you know, applying himself quite to the, the sort of regimented discipline that Rod Ellingworth was laying down there. It's funny because we know a lot about what Rod Ellingworth did and with that academy and you know set up with Mark Cavendish. I know that you know Geraint Thomas was an early guy there. Matt Bramier, of course, was was in that academy as well uh, before he opted to ride for Ireland instead. I think what's what's amazing when you hear the stories about the academy is just how many people did buy into it and did take it seriously when he was setting up, you know, classrooms in the velodrome and so on. And you know, I think it's inevitable that maybe one or two wouldn't buy into it. And I, I believe that Blythe wasn't so enamoured with that that sort of regimented, very disciplined environment. But you know, he's he left the academy under under a bit of a cloud, perhaps. He left BMC certainly under a bit of a cloud. You know, someone starts to gain a bit of a reputation and it does, doesn't matter how good they are, how fast they are, um, are is, a, is another big team going to take a risk on them, I suppose, is the question. Well, yeah, we may well find out. I mean, as we know from speaking to agents, Daniel, as you're quite close to an, an agent or two. Andrew McQuaid I've spoken to during the Tour de France. He's an agent for a number of riders. And there really isn't a lot of... Uh, places going around this year it's, it's a bit like a game of musical chairs in which the number of chairs keeps getting taken away and, and there's no music and there's no music yeah exactly so it's not like a game of musical <laughs> chairs at all chairs uh, Lionel I think you spoke to Philip Gilber who we've been talking to a little bit uh, about a little bit uh, yeah I did well um, just off the mall after the finish um, he hadn't made the podium I don't think had he I uh, know he was uh, in that five man group fourth or fifth um, I just grabbed a quick word with him and he made the point that his move with the Amiga Farmer quick step rider uh, Julian Alaphilippe um, and Philippe Gilbert, it's a bit one for the commentators to get their tongues mixed up on, um, he said that that was his bid for victory and, and he, he was talking about how difficult it is to uh, make headway when the roads are so flat and there's very little sort of uphill ramps to really gain any leverage on um, and he made a point in the final uh, the finishing straight about the, the fact that it was quite a strong tailwind and, and that's probably why Blythe went so early because he really did come past the line of riders with quite a jump and the gap he made was reasonably significant very quickly and then once he was benefiting from that tailwind just as much as the guys behind and probably more so than the guys behind trying to close the door so uh, this is Philippe Gilbert and his reading of the finish I'm not the best specialist when uh, when it's like on high speed like this like we were going like almost 60k an hour when it was flat with the, the tailwind and uh, this is hard to hold this uh, this speed for me. And in the final, who did you think was the favourite? You know Adam Blythe very well, were you, were you thinking that he would be the one to beat in the sprint? I know he's always smart in the sprint like he did today and uh, you know, he, I think he did a great sprint, he came from behind with the tailwind and uh, yeah, he was just really strong. And lastly, you know Adam very well. Do you think it's time, you know, he could move back into the World Tour level team next season, perhaps? I don't know. He has the potential, that's for sure. That's, but it's just about if he wants or not. But he has the potential to do it. But I don't, I don't know if he want, really wants to, to do this yet. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Free. You actually held Philip Gilbert up a bit there, Lionel, because I was ahead of you, and uh, by the time he came, he emerged from the mall, they'd actually reopened the, the road, Paul Mall, and the traffic was going back and forth, and he, he initially started riding up on the wrong side of the road, not not maybe being so familiar with uh, our left-hand driving here. So 
you know, potentially a disastrous incident occurred. And you're holding me responsible for that. I'm, I am very sorry, obviously. Well, he did make it back to the bus safely in the end and I think uh, incurred the wrath there of Alan Piper, his boss at BMC, did he not? Well, yeah, I was hoping to go, grab a word with Alan Piper because he was a sports director at BMC when Adam Blythe was there and I wanted to try and get their perspective on why they allowed Blythe to leave a year early before his contract was up. And Alan was happy enough to talk, but he was packing the car full of bikes and wheels and, and trying to pack up and get ready. He said they had to be at Gatwick within 45 minutes um, and they were, they were running behind. And it just struck me, you know, the stress level here at a race like this, which finished quite late, 6 o'clock it finished. Everyone wants to get away, they want to get their flights back to Europe or wherever it is they're going. Um, and he made the point that, you know, BMC are currently competing in three different races and their staff is stretched incredibly thin and they're on a real tight uh, timetable to get everybody away. And uh, Gilbert came back asking for a key to the, one of the other vehicles and Alan r lost it slightly and said, oh, I gave you the effing key and um, then declined to do the interview because he had to get to Gatwick. You didn't get that on tape, did you? I didn't know. Most some, some later. I think it's most swearing later, isn't it? Yeah, we can, something to look forward to. I'm sure we'll also reflect a bit more um, chaps on the, the post-tour de France period that we've all had. I went straight up to Glasgow for the Commonwealth Games. Uh, Lionel uh, went into sort of training camp mode, even though you stayed at home. Daniel just sort of minced around London a bit. and <laughs> some work. I'm going to the Arctic tomorrow, of course. Off to the Arctic no, for the... Um, yeah, the day after tomorrow. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, people give you listen to this at any time, Daniel. It's meaningless. <laughs> Absolutely meaningless. Anyway, um, at the finish, I uh, spoke to Ian Stannard and Ben Swift. Ian Stannard has missed most of the year after a terrible uh, crash. Gent Wevelgem. It was Gent Wevelgem. He fell off and uh, broke a vertebrae. And he, he missed, you know, all the cobbled classics that he'd been building towards, having one hit news plaid. Would have perhaps been a, one of the contenders, at least for... Pyro Bay, you would have thought, and uh, obviously very disappointed. Returned to action at the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. Didn't look in great shape, has to be said. It was terrible weather, terrible conditions, and he didn't. He was sort of among the back markers after about a lap there. A bit better today at the London Surrey Classic. Uh, looked in, in slightly better shape, and um, obviously it's a, he's on the the road back. So I spoke to Ian Stannard, and I also spoke to Ben Swift, who came here straight from the Tour of Poland, uh, didn't quite get a stage win there um, and finished second today. It's been a, a very long, boring process to be honest and uh, it's just nice to be back racing. The coming games didn't exactly go that well but you know it's nice to be back in the action today and getting stuck in and uh, hopefully it's the way forward and a few little steps and got in a Konex, so going there now and uh, just see how it goes really. I mean, no plans, no nothing, just get through the year and get a bit of fitness back and my racing legs if you like. It must have been difficult because you were on great form, you know, you won hit Newsblad, everything yeah. looked great for the Cobble Classics, it must have been very, very disappointing to sit those out. Yeah, I mean, it was nice to have won Newsblad and yeah, I'm happy to have won that and it was nice to have got that, but yeah, it finished in a boggy ditch quite abruptly and that was it, game over, so... And, and, yeah. and watching the tour as well, you know, Dave Brills was said during the tour, you, you'd have been the first name yeah. on the team sheet. And watching that cobbled stage in particular, did you watch that with real pangs? Wishing yeah, you were there? no, I mean, I wish I was there. It was great. And uh, yeah, it was really good. Well, it looked good fun. And the way G was flying through the groups and stuff, I just wished I was there. But yeah, I mean, it looked hard for the guys as well with Froomey crashing and then Richie getting a bit ill and not having a great time. So yeah, it looked hard, but I wish I was there. and. You know, that's my aim next year to get back to the classics and start off where I left, you know. 100% now, no, no after effects. Um, like a few little bits and bobs, you know, causing me some grief and not super comfy on the bike. But, you know, I think it's just a matter of time, you know, when you really think about the size of the injury I had and the problems it's caused, you know, I'm quite lucky and a lot of physio and you know hopefully in the next season I'm going to be back where I am it's just about being sensible at the moment at the end of the season what are your plans for the, the last few couple of months of the year um, so I've got Eneco tomorrow starting see how that goes and take it from there really um, you know it's going to be hard and it's hard work riding your bike I didn't realise it was so tough so not, not the Vuelta that would probably be too much is it uh, I'd love to do the Vuelta but I think I'll be realistic and it's probably too much and yeah, it might frazzle me for next year as well, but in my head I've got it there that I want to do it and it's good preparation for next year. So it year, really so. depends how you come through Eneco. Yeah, absolutely, but I think the sensible option would be not to ride it, to be honest. So, I mean, it starts quite soon after Eneco as well, so 
it's going to take a lot out of me that race alone. So yeah. It's always nice to win, but I think it was a really, really tough race, and it showed that the condition is is good. But there's still a lot to come. You know, I've got goals later down the line. Uh, Tour of Poland was my first race since the national championship, so it was a bit of a break. And that didn't exactly go to plan Tour of Poland, so just happy to come back here and be in the mix again. You had a few crashes in Poland, didn't you? A few, a few war wins mm. from that? Actually, relatively unscathed, just good dance moves on the on the slippy floors. But, yeah, I mean, it wasn't ideal to get the crashes. I hurt my shoulder a little bit, and we just took, we said just chill out a little bit and just get ready for Sunday. You must be happy with your year, though, Ben, because you had serious injury last year. You've come back very strong this year. Yeah, definitely really happy to get last year behind me and just to completely forget about it to be honest and I think this year I'm lacking a little bit after missing so much in last year so I'm really happy to have a strong year but it's I think that was my sixth second place now so it'd be nice if they'd be turned into wins you know and what's the plan for the next couple of months what how are you going to end the season uh normally it's going to be Hamburg Plouet Britain and the world championship so good couple of goals coming up in the in the next few weeks do you ever watch back that uh, video replay of Milan San Remo I have done a few times, but it's nice to forget about it now. So we've still got the winter ahead of us, but looking forward, is that a race that next year you will be really targeting? Yeah, without a doubt. I've had a little look at the new climb that they're going to put in, and I think it's going to be a hard, make it a lot harder, but if I have Perry Basco for my, I don't see why I why potentially can't be there trying to get over the climbs, you know? So it's definitely a, a race that I like, and I've well done well in in the past, so... So we heard there from Ian Stannard and Ben Swift, uh, both of Team Sky. Um, as I was speaking to them, Lionel and Daniel, I think you were speaking to Dave Brailsford about his new gadget that he wears on his wrist, measuring his sleep and how many steps he's taken. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that later on, but it sounded intriguing. Um, it's a strange period, this, though, isn't it? We mentioned, I mentioned earlier the post-tour period. We've had the um, Tour of Poland last week. We've got the Tour of Utah going on at the moment. The Eneco Tour begins this week. There's lots Denmark, of Tour of Denmark. Tour of Denmark. Yeah, there's lo- lots of races. Um, do any of them really capture the imagination? It's very strange after the tour to to be watching races where they they just inevitably fall a little bit flat. Even today's London Surrey Classic, we were used to big crowds in Great Britain. There were huge crowds at the Commonwealth Games. Um, Brian Holm, who we're hearing from later on, m- mentioned the. The lack of crowds today, it wasn't, it was terrible weather, might put people off, but there weren't, weren't huge crowds today, and it all just feels a little bit flat, doesn't it? I think it's inevitable. You, you come to the end of the tour, and the spotlight has been so intense and so heavy on the Tour de France, and it, it feels like the, the, the arrival on the Champs Elysees is, is a full stop for the cycling season, but actually, it's not. It's, it's no more than a semicolon, really, because we've got these. You know, we've got these great long paragraphs being written about uh, these races, the Tour of Poland, which really par- should... Would the paragraph follow on from the semicolon? Or how, long, more, how long can you continue this metaphor? I think, I think it probably it, it sustained itself up to the comment about the semicolon and then, then fell a little flat, admittedly. Um, but, yeah, the Tour of Poland, I mean, this year we've had Rafa Majka, um, who was the kind of Polish sensation of the Tour de France, won two mountain stages and King of the Mountains jersey, and he's won the Tour of Poland, so that's huge for him, huge for Polish cycling, but in the grand scheme of things, I mean, it was quite tough to sit down and watch that first day of the Tour of Poland and really kind of immerse yourself in it with, I mean, there, there, it was an interesting day because they had terrible weather, all those trees fell down, and then the following day there was the breakaway rider who the bunch seemed to have forgotten about, so there were still stories, still interest and intrigue, but even talking to Charlie Wigelius towards the end of the Tour de France he was feeling battle weary about the fact that there's so many of these races Tour of Poland Eneco Tour as I say Daniel Tour of Denmark and then you know the Tour de Lane where Mark Cavendish will be riding in his comeback race after injury it just it kind of goes on and on and on but there isn't anything that really stands out until you get to the Vuelta so it feels a bit like the season is marking time it's not like the old days when they had all the exhibition crits um, dotted around Holland Belgium and France and then the sort of world championships right at the height of the summer. I think the, the season had more definition back then. Yeah, I think what's happened is the, there are a lot of um, fairly new races. I mean, some of them have been going for 10, 15 years, but um, probably the, the, the calendar back then was mainly taken up by those post-tour crits. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, when cycling was reformed, reorganised, we had various things like the, the Pro Tour, um, spots, quite sort of prestigious spots or nominally prestigious 
spots did become available, and all of these te- all of these um, uh, new races or, or races that previously held different positions in the calendar have kind of piled in, haven't they? And it's a little bit of a, a sort of bottleneck now with them. Um, you know, we talked about Denmark. You know, I forgot the Tour of Portugal, which is a, a real sort of um, fade. Don't say hipster, Daniel. Wow. That's my favourite race. The hipsters, the hipsters Grand Tour, the Tour of Portugal. Richard, you actually had a bit of a, 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 an email exchange, I think, with Jonathan Vorters, who pretty much made the point that the reason Garmin Sharp weren't here at the Ride London Classic was because they just don't have enough riders to go round. And you look at some of the big teams that have got huge rosters, Amiga Farmer, Quickstep, BMC Racing, and even they're struggling to put sort of six riders, six strong riders into an event like this. You can see why teams end up filling their roster and, and making sure they've got 30 odd riders well i mean yeah garmin sharp were down to ride this race and pulled out only this week and i have to say it was a disappointing field i mean this is a this is a big race i suppose i mean it should be a big race it's it, the center of london is closed for it it begins at olympic park so it's sort of an olympic legacy event it has a big sponsor um and it's it's a good it's a good course i mean the riders always make the race of course but it should be a it should be a great race this um, and it was a fairly entertaining race today but uh, in terms of big names it was really lacking sadly lacking and and that is a, that is a shame you know because um, the, the 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 butter is spread very very thin at the moment and only Team Sky were there with their bus for example for everyone else it's a sort of a compromise effort there are camper vans there are team cars there's Alan Piper doing the job of about six different people and it all just feels a bit. Um, I don't want to, I can't swear kind of but half arsed um, and you don't feel like you're getting the best of some of the best teams or the best riders and you know that that for this event is a great shame and you know Sir Bradley Wiggins began and obviously that sort of rescued it in terms of adding a bit of um, a sparkle to the event in terms of the impression of the event but the, the perception of it but it, it does feel as though uh, it's not quite building on what is there you know and you wonder how long it's going to last I think the 20 odd thousand people who rode the mass participation sportive would, would have a very different um, mm. perspective on it and I, I think that the, the the pro race almost plays second fiddle to the sportive in a funny kind of way because there's so much sort of social media talk and chatter and people taking pictures out on the course and obviously today's ride for the amateur cyclist was pretty epic sorry to use the, the cliched word with the, with the wind and the rain um, it is that event that really is sustaining the whole weekend because if you can get 25,000 people engaged in cycling in the way they have then you can justify closing down the centre of London in the same way that they close for the London Marathon. But this is always where cycling and running are so different isn't it? I mean the London Marathon the the mass participation event and the elite race are integrated because they all start at the same time. Here the, the professional race is, is a bolt on and I think it's great that they have you know they call it they, they, they were bigging up as the biggest the world's biggest festival of cycling I'm not sure about that but you know they had an elite women's race last night in the centre of London they had the the sportif and then they had the pro race and uh, you know it, the, the pro race and the sportif are, are two entirely different events there isn't really an awful lot of crossover there I'm not sure how explicitly um, Mick Bennett and Sweet Spot the organisers of this race have try, uh, have said that they've tried to copy <laughs> the um, Hamburg Cyclassics model but it's interesting we've mentioned on the podcast before that the bubble the cycling bubble really burst in Germany with Opera in Puerto and Jan Ulrich's retirement um, but that event has, has remained incredibly successful both the and the pro race continues despite having lost what was the World Cup status back then um, it continues to attract quite big names perhaps not as big as it used to and the amateur event is wildly successful I think almost on a par with what we saw here today yeah, I think just on the sportive event, there, just, there was a surreal moment watching the live television coverage in the press tent as we were, where Jonathan Edwards, uh, a, and a, a world champion, certainly triple jumper, and Martin Johnson, a former England rugby captain. Martin Johnson, huge, great man, 115 kilos apparently. He covered That's the same court. weight as you at the end of the tour, Lionel. <laughs> yeah, but I'm down to I'm down to about 102 now, so um, going in the right direction, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Martin Johnson. You know, he he's he's done a lot of um, a lot of these kind of prestigious charity rides, multi-day rides. I think he was. Uh, you know, he's done a similar kind of uh, charity event that Lawrence Delalio, another former England rugby captain, has done. You know, I think Lawrence Delalio rode between all the venues of the Six Nations um, countries for 
for charity. And there was just this surreal moment. Ten years ago, you couldn't have imagined cycling being kind of that mainstream. Four hours of coverage on BBC Two. Former England rugby captain whose name and uh, voice will resonate with many sports fans across the country had ridden the event and really enjoyed it. And I think that people are still coming to cycling. It hasn't. The growth hasn't stopped. And I think, you know, folk, how many people would have actually w sat down to watch four hours of the Ride London Classic? I'm not terribly sure. I'm not terribly sure. It's a great. Um, advert necessarily for the, the brilliance of road racing I think you could edit it into a wonderful kind of highlights package and really encapsulate the tactical moves that went on but when you're actually watching it in real time I'm not terribly sure it's got the same uh, level of drama as a grand tour stage or certainly a good good grand tour stage No and I'm maybe being a little bit harsh uh, in saying that, that there isn't a lot of crossover because you, you probably you wouldn't have the pro race without the sportif so it is an interesting model. It's still in its infancy. I think this is the, only the, the second year, isn't it, of this race? And the, you just hope that they can attract the biggest teams and some more big riders because Gilbert added an awful lot today, an awful lot more than Peter Sagan last year, who was the big, the big name last year. So Bradley Wiggins rode and finished. Is that, um, is that the link to Sagan? Is this no, the no, bit where we start talking about Sagan? Not quite. So, I was going to say uh, one interesting last year, one subplot last year was the team. Sky sent a pretty, pretty much a B team or a C team or a, a D team or a, a J team last year to this race uh, and they sent a better team this year I understood last year that was because they had, were keen on the title sponsorship for the weekend and Prudential had it but they, they really did send a good team uh, this year and Ben Swift was obviously right there in the mix definitely wanted to win it as we heard in his interview, that's his sixth second place this year. So he, he was close, but, but no cigar. But um, they, they put in a good team, contributed a lot to the race. Daniel, what were you going to say about P we had something well, to say about Sagan, well, weren't we? Yeah, but just before we do that, let's just wrap up on the ride, uh, right, London Surrey right, Classic. Right, Hang on, because a challenge, a challenge has been laid down by um, friend of the podcast, Matt Rabin. No, this is not an appropriate time to bring this up there isn't an appropriate time to bring this up well we've, we've been challenged by Matt Rabin who, who allegedly claims he rode um, the Sportive this morning uh, there's some, some Matt doubt Rabin about Rabin is that. allegedly a chiropractor for Garmin Sharp as well <laughs> uh, he's challenged Which doctor he's, he's challenged us to ride next year so uh, are you two up for the challenge well the problem is the timing I mean it comes straight after the Tour de France uh, we've all been sitting in a car for a month it's not great for training for something like this is it Daniel's shaking his head I mean, my answer is a lot simpler than that it's just a no <laughs> so sorry Matt we won't be doing that I'm still willing to think about it they have thought about it it's a no from me um, and on the pro race um, we should mention also that um, today was the competitive debut in as a fully fledged um, green edge rider for one of the big sort of sensations on the under 23 scene Caleb Ewan who's kind of been billed as the um, the, the Australian Mark Cavendish uh, he was sort of slumped on the pavement after the finish um, everyone came over the line looking very muddy today didn't they like it had been a, a tough few hours out there um, he certainly was and um, I grabbed a quick word with him just to ask him about his first day he's actually officially a stagiaire he's going to turn pro um, with the team at the end of the season but I asked him about his experience today no yeah it was it was quite hard and I think the narrow roads as well yeah. through the through the hills made it really hard as well to hold position and yeah. and once you lost position it was kind of hard to get back to the front but yeah tough day uh, at one point it looked though as though you might make it across to the decisive move no so you, you must have been feeling pretty good um yeah I mean I got into the break and you know, I, was, I was feeling a little bit tired still I'm um, not really used to the 200k races yet yeah. so I think just I was just lacking that little bit in the back end when Gilbert went I went on his wheel and you know, I just couldn't hold it in the end right. and you've kind of been billed I mean even on the TV commentary there today the Australian Cavendish and um, I mean obviously that's a, that's a fairly big burden but um do you see yourself as just a pure sprinter or you've got more in your locker than that? Um, yeah, I don't know, like, I think, yeah, I don't know if I'm a pure sprinter yet. You know, like, in the under-23 races, we all still race pretty aggressively. It's not, it's not so controlled and I think that's why I'm so used to just, when I see the break go, like today, I sort of just jump straight on it. And, and then once I got in that, you know, I was just, those guys were so strong and, I probably just didn't have that top end that those pros that yeah, the guys have been pro for a bit longer you know, they have that real diesel sort of engine and I just don't have that yet Yeah. 
and, and you've obviously done some big races before, but this is the first one at this level. Were you nervous, emotional this morning to, to make your debut like that? Um, well, I did the Tour Down Under, obviously not with the team, with the Uni SA, but yeah, and it, I mean, it's like, it was really exciting to do my first uh, first race with Green Edge. You know, it's sort of, I guess this is the start. Mm. Okay. And um, just last thing, Caleb, the um, rest of the season, how's it looking for you but in programme-wise? Um, my next big race will be Tour de l'Avenir, and then that will lead into the World Championships, and then after the World Championships, if, if everything's going well, um, I'll do a tour of Beijing with the team and obviously uh, turn pro in October so I can do the, the world tour races. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Tweet us at cycling underscore podcast. We're still standing outside a, a pub, uh, the Clarence in London, and it seems like a, an opportune moment. We've just been tweeted by our good friend Chiro Scogni Emilio, who's on holiday and has been tweeting regularly from his uh, Greek hideaway. And uh, yeah, let's introduce uh, Peddler de Charme. And now, Peddler de Charme. Daniel, I think you've got a nomination for this. Well, it's a young Frenchman, it has to be. Some things never change, so we're not on the tour anymore, but um, that trope remains. Um, so, Julien Alaphilippe was very active today, wasn't he? As Richard, you would say he animated the race. Not, not a word that I enjoy. I don't, I don't say that. I don't say that. Oh, okay. You were complaining about that word earlier. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't particularly like it. But anyway. Lionel, Lionel doesn't like made the junction. Yeah. I hate that. It doesn't mean anything in any language. Okay, Lionel. <laughs> Back in your kennel. Um, <laughs> so, um, Alaphilippe um, rode very well today. I think, he, did he get third in the end? Um, but he is a young Frenchman we've not spoken much about um, he's a former cyclocross rider still rides cyclocross very good um, in that discipline he's, he's been sort of snatched under the noses of the big French teams by Omega Pharma Quickstep I think he was spotted by one of their soigneurs um, in Belgium and he rode for their development team um, he's a really he's a kind of punchy sort of sprinter puncher um, his father is an orchestra conductor bit of, bit of trivia for you um, and I chatted after the race today with Brian Holm, his Omega Pharma direct sportif. After talking about Alaphilippe, we then talked about Mark Cavendish. Mark Cavendish spent a few days having crashed out of the Tour de France, or I think one day or two days, um, in the Omega Pharma quick step team car as a sort of apprentice direct to sportif. And Brian in this clip gives his verdict on Cav's performances with a little bit of swearing, possibly if our editor doesn't manage to bleep it out. I think he would be the next big one in cycling. The way he's riding, you know, he's like a bit of jelly bear style. You oh, yeah. know, he can climb, he can sprint, he can basically do everything. He got character, and uh, for sure, he's gonna win his races sooner or later. And uh, a former cyclocross rider, correct? And uh, a bit of a sort of puncher, sprinter. Is that what? How would you describe him? Yeah, he's a bit like uh, he isn't a roller, but like, like bit something between a climber and a sprinter. He's, yeah. he's climbing like maybe more like a Gilbert okay. style. Uh, he can go unbelievably fast on the small climbs and even survive climb up to like 10 kilometers, you know, and then uh, I think he's going to win point sprint, and maybe not point sprint, but like out of 50 riders, like should be, uh, he can place himself and uh, uh, mentally is a little bit crazy, a little bit like <laughs> Cavendish, you know, like, oh, yeah? so it's quite good for, for he's he got ambitions, he's greedy, you know, like. Crazy in a good way, temperamental, sort of. When I say crazy, I say crazy with love in my heart. <laughs> I think I know what you mean. Um, and talking of Cav, you had him in the team car, didn't you, in the Tour de France? Um, how is he shaping up as a? How's his future career as a director sportive shaping up? Ah, I think uh, not too good. Eh? He f***ed up <laughs> in the Commonwealth, didn't he? That's true, actually. It yeah. wasn't too impressive. I wasn't happy about his performance. So uh, I think he had a bit to learn still. And the Tour. He was behind uh, Bagland, wasn't he? That he blew that also on the climb, and then he tried, got one more chance. So he's, I mean, you always got three chances, so we got one left. I hope he <laughs> do that better. How, how would he respond to that? How well, would he defend himself? Oh, winning the next one, of course, is quite easy. Eh? Yeah, yeah. He f***ed up the two first, one more chance, and that is over. Isn't <laughs> it? You know, that would be the rocket science yeah. inside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, this week he's coming back at the Tour de La, which is a bit of a a sort of strange race for him to do. It seems like a strange race, a small French stage race. Um, but what's the idea of sending him there? Uh, first of all, we all love the French 
races, don't we? <laughs> and uh, next is basically the only one but to uh, preparation before uh, Welter to get a bit of shape, to hurt his legs a little bit. I mean, we all knew today would be too difficult, you know, one day race like today. It's a quite hard circuit here, I mean, even when you saw today, everything exploding, crashes. He's been a bit worried about his, uh, what he called collarbone ligament, you know, and uh, hopefully it's a bit bigger roads, you know, to the line and a uh, few flat stages, time so the start. We know he's picking up also, and so that was feeling good in his program. So uh, we, we stay optimistic about uh, to the line. Okay. And then the Vuelta, you expect him to be good there and competitive and possibly winning, winning sprints? Uh, first of all, I think he has to survive the first week, and then we know him. I mean, when he first starts to cast up, it's going quite fast. But okay, first we have to get him to the Vuelta, and we can't say, take that for given yet. He's going to be there. We have to see how he's going to survive to the line. So we heard there from Brian Holm, who was uh, pretty damning of uh, Mark Cavendish as a, as a DS, but maybe looking after his own position there, I don't know. I mean, he mentioned the Commonwealth Games. I was up in Glasgow for the Commonwealth Games. Daniel will, will literally switch off at this point, probably turn away. Um, but, you know, for Daniel's Daniel's thing as young Frenchman, my thing, I suppose, is the Commonwealth Games. And and, <laughs> and it was a it was wonderful methadone to go, go from go from the Tour de France to the Commonwealth Games. There was a real buzz in Glasgow. What an appropriate... Not, not, <laughs> not, not unfamiliar with methadone, perhaps. And um, No, it was, it was a wonderful buzz there, wonderful atmosphere, you know, lots of sport going on, lots of people very up for it. Uh, the cycling was good. Um, time trial was good. I thought a very worthy winner in uh, Alex Dowsett and, uh, in the men's time trial. And in the women's race, of course, uh, Lizzie Armstead won the, won the road race and... Um, who won the the men's race? Garen Thomas. No, I was going to say a very worthy winner there in the men's race. Well, Garen Thomas, because uh, you know he's uh, so often so selfless uh, for other people. We saw that at the tour did a power of work for for others. Well, more than that, I mean, Garen Thomas is somebody who we're always talking about. Uh, the number of times he seems to get caught up in crashes in big races and in the Tour de France as well. He was on the deck virtually every day in the first week, it seemed. Um, and then when he's cruising to victory, stronger than the other two in the break, Jack Bauer and Scott Thwaite by, by a mile, opened up a big gap very quickly. Uh, perhaps the other two thought, well, we've got silver and bronze in the bag, so we, we perhaps don't need to commit everything here. Um, nevertheless, Thomas opened up a huge gap and then punctured. Um, and that gap, which was about 50 seconds, was tumbling down, and we watched as the uh, neutral service man um, effected a fairly slow well, wheel hang change. On, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. It was, it was, um, it was agonising to watch. He, he did have, I think, 48 seconds at the time. It took about 30 seconds for the wheel change. Uh, in defence of the neutral service man, he'd been sitting on the back of a motorbike for four hours in the freezing cold conditions. On neutral service, the wheels are adjusted for any bike possible so the skewers are are very are opened right out you know and and there, there are things in terms of adjusting the brakes and getting the other wheel out that are all quite complicated and in those kind of conditions and i think he was unfairly possibly unfairly criticized i also wouldn't have liked to have been him uh, repairing uh, sorry replacing the the front wheel of the guy who's leading the race with a narrow gap over the other guys i have to say as well just to add to that um, Garen Thomas deserves a lot of credit for not, um, you know, he, he was cool He was cool as a cucumber, he didn't give the guy a hard time, um, he just waited for him to do the job, took off again and by the end he won by about a minute and a half, so he was a very worthy winner. Yeah, I was going to mention that because somebody I think tweeted um, and, and addressed that point to you, Richard, on, on Twitter, that, that really Garen Thomas was a sort of consummate professional there. He let the guy charge with the job, get on with the job, uh, rather than sort of trying to get involved himself. And that must have taken real sort of, um, you know, ice cold blood to just keep his cool in that, uh, when, when, the, when the lead was being sliced yeah. away. It was great to see Garen Thomas win a race, win a race that meant an awful lot to him because he's a very proud Welshman and you know, he made a big point as he came up to finish straight up pointing at uh, Wales on his jersey. And, you know, that, that was... That was, that was good to see, actually. I enjoyed that. Um, Daniel, Daniel, back, back with Daniel, us. Back with us. Daniel, Daniel's Daniel. just totally zoned out. <laughs> Daniel, what are you looking at, Daniel? You're looking... You're, you're, you're miles away. Are you, you're thinking about Peter Sagan? Yeah, that's it. 
That's it. You want me to talk about Sagan now? Yeah, let's talk about Sagan. Let's talk about his new team boss, Oleg Tinkov, as well. Well, Sagan's move. I think we, we did we did we mention that on the podcast a few months ago that we thought that he would sign for Tinkov Sack. So that was confirmed this week. Um, and yeah, not much of a surprise. A lot of debate this week about how they're going to reconcile his objectives with Alberto Contador's objectives at the Tour de France. I, I'm not sure that it's going to be so much of a problem because, well, I think one of the things that we overlooked ourselves, perhaps about Sagan this year's Tour de France, was that there were there were no um, there were no uphill sprints that were obviously suited to him, which is I think his best um, his sort of best terrain, particularly when he's faced with you know the, the best riders in the world. Um, and you know there were there were finishes with climbs at the end where we we saw him try to go away on descents a few times, but there, there weren't that many stages that were perfectly suited to him. And um, also, you know, we saw that every other team had taken, um, or they'd realised that Canada had come with eight guys dedicated to Sagan. So that was a perfect excuse for them to always turn around to Canada and say, well, you've got to do all of the work. Next year, Sagan will be in a position where he might say, well, look, I've only got one or two domestiques, so. Um, you know, you guys have got to do some work to, to bring this back together. And um, so, I'm not n- sure that it's going to be so much of a problem. Also, how many green jerseys <laughs> does Sagan need to win? You know, I mean, um, I, I, I mean, he's got he's got another decade potentially at the top. He can easily break Sean Kelly's record. Um, well, Eric, Eric Zarbel's Zarbel's record, record, record sorry, six, sorry. isn't I it? At, I, I mean, looked at you there, Lionel, <laughs> knowing that you're the Sean Kelly expert. I always get that mixed up. So it's um, Zarbel's holds the record, doesn't he? Zarbel has six, but again, Did lost have any in taken, the, taken from him. Again, whether whether any were were deleted, I'm not terribly sure. They certainly haven't been officially deleted. I don't think much as Richard Viron's polka dot jerseys haven't been officially deleted. I do wonder, thinking about the green jersey competition, whether Christian Prudhomme will have a slight change of heart whether Thierry Gouverneau will look at how that competition is shaping up because if they keep the rules the way they are at the moment then Peter Sagan is just going to keep winning green jerseys without really being challenged because it actually doesn't suit the purer sprinters as much as I think when they when they when they had this sort of big intermediate sprint idea a few years ago they thought that that would would um, play more into the hands of, uh, of the, of the yeah, of major sprinters yeah, yeah Mark Cavendish in particular and I think the balance is not quite right at the moment it, mainly because no one is able to challenge Peter Sagan um, who, who was second in the competition I don't know but I can't remember it but it was you know 200 and something points behind Brian Cockar was up there quite well but really without doing a great deal um, and you know Sagan won that competition at such a canter without even winning a stage and I think perhaps we may get to the tour presentation in October in Paris and, and p- possibly find that the uh, the rules have been tweaked a little bit, I don't know Who knows, Let, let's uh, turn our attention to Oleg Tinkoff, his new team boss who sort of teased and toyed with people in the run up to the announcement of Sagan's uh, signing um, but, you know, Tinkoff gave also, as, as well as having this sort of comic persona on Twitter, gave a, gave a serious interview last week to Cycling News and, and said some things in it that really should not go unchallenged in terms of, uh, particularly around the case of Roman Kreuziger, his rider who was um, sort of suspended before the, the Tour de France for irregularities in his biological passport. Um, and also with some of the insinuations he made about the, the fact that Ollie Cookson, Brian Cookson, the UCI president's son, is employed by Team Sky. That seemed incredibly mischievous. Um, and, and libelous. And possibly libelous, yeah. Because, the, 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 well, the, the, the accusation he made basically was that there was some link between Ollie Cookson's employment by Team Sky and Roman Kreuziger being withdrawn from the Tour de France he would have been a very useful lieutenant to Alberto Contador, who at that point looked like he would fight Chris Froome for the, for the tour title. Um, now, Tinkoff, does he, do we indulge him? Because he does present this very, not just on Twitter, but at the tour itself when he gives interviews, he's large in life, he's very flamboyant, he says things that are designed to be funny and humorous. Then he comes out with things that really, that should be challenged at the very least, No. 
Well, yeah, I think, Richard, uh, the, this year's Tour de France was the first time I'd really seen Oleg Tinkoff sort of up close, and he really is a larger-than-life character. He's very tall, he's got a sort of a mane of kind of silvery blonde curly hair, uh, the suntan, he clearly does a lot of cycling, he's a very fit guy, um, he's there, he's got some quite attractive women sort of hanging around at the, at the, um, the Tinkoff Sacklo bus, he j- makes jokes about celebrating with champagne and uh, and Richard on the couple of times we had him on the podcast um, had little interviews with him you know he does say things that really catch the ear and in that sense do we indulge him yes we do in a way because journalists flock to him because they know if they point their microphones under his mouth he's going to say something interesting and the sport is crying out for characters like that however there has to be a line where kind of um, you know, professionalism takes over, and I think that indulging Oleg Tinkov to the extent that he's allowed to challenge um, the way, particularly the biological passport is being run. I mean, yeah, I think you know, Wada has, has, has indicated that the biological passport um, case with Roman Kreutziger is all you know they're well, they're perfectly yeah, satisfied mean, he, with he's it. He's threatened to sue the UCI. Um, basically, his complaint is that. You know, he's been paying Roman Kreuzsicker's wages all year, the guy's not been in action, um, and that there's a, a problem with rider. The, the fact that teams don't know really by what criteria riders are sidelined through biological passport anomalies, he's complaining about lack of transparency with that. But there's an awful which lot... Which is a valid point. Which is a valid point, but is, it, uh, is there another way? I mean, th- there's an awful lot with a biological passport where... There is has to be sort of implicit trust in the experts appointed by the UCI to manage that program, no? I think one of the problems with the biological passport is that all of the experts who know how it operates work on the side of the biological passport. We haven't yet reached a stage of maturity where <laughs> there are another panel of experts that the teams can perhaps rely on to say, can we have some counter-analysis of this? So really, there is a, po- there is a point to be made that the biological passport has to be maintained and held up and... Um, Uh, survive these challenges in order for it to continue because if somebody rides a coach and horses through it either with a with an expensive legal challenge and let's face it Oleg Tinkoff is a very wealthy individual if if he chose to take on the UCI on this matter um, he could he could cause a bit of angst for the UCI which is not a wealthy organization no I mean Daniel you do make a, a valid point however I there was one line in that interview in cycling news which I found quite chilling and it was the um, the one about the uh, the meeting that was held between at the tour between Andy Reese, who owns BMC, and Oleg Tinkoff, um, who owns Tinkoff Saxo, in Andy Reese's chateau, and this idea that the two of them were were plotting the future of cycling. I, nothing against those two individuals at all, but this idea that two wealthy individuals can have so much power, so much clout in the sport is is concerning, I think, and I think that you know that there has to be. Uh, some very strong leadership from the UCI, from Brian Cookson, who's the president of the UCI, um, that the, the UCI is in charge, not Oleg Tinkoff and not Andy Rees. Well, there has to be some redress. I mean, you know, we see this all the time in football. Um, Jose Mourinho, the manager of Chelsea, is um, a repeat offender when it comes to challenging, criticising authorities and other managers. And there is, you know, there are sanctions, and sometimes they're quite, they're sort of quite reasonable. They're fines, which are really meaningless. But in the UCI's case, there is... Um, a very obvious form in which they could punish Oleg Tinkoff. If he's saying, I think if he's challenging the workings of the biological passport um, in a responsible way, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if he's suggesting in a slanderous manner that the um, Sky are receiving preferential treatment because the UCI president's son works for them, um, well, th- there's the renewal of um, the World Tour licenses is one. Um, thing that the UCI can threaten him with and you know that is that is one way in which they can sort of um, exact justice I think the thing is that cycling in in the grand scheme of things is not a uh, not a wealthy sport rich individuals can buy their way into a very high level with relatively small sums of money when compared to certainly the American sports or uh, the top flights of European football. And they're welcomed with open arms because cycling is so desperate for wealthy investors. Yeah, and uh, really when we're talking about individuals shaping the future of cycling, let's not forget, you know, the Garmin Sharp team has got a lot softer image but it also has a 
a very, very wealthy benefactor, Doug Ellis, um, a, a businessman who has pumped an awful lot of money into that team. And, and Jonathan Waters, who runs that team, he fancies himself as being at the forefront of any reshaping. I think there's two things, two sides of this, really, that will need to be um, reconciled as we go forward. There, there are wealthy individuals who run teams and then there are serious corporate entities that want to sponsor teams that are run and, and one of those would be Sky uh, which has a, a huge Just company. Just the only one. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the others are quite small, you know, Giant or Cannondale or, you know, there's they're bike manufacturing companies. And then you've got the likes of Lamprey um, and in France you've got Coffee Dish, which is a, is a sizable company putting in a lot of money, not, not necessarily getting uh, value for money for Francois Migraine's company there because they spend probably pound for pound, probably the least effective sponsorship in the, wor- in, in the top level of, of cycling. But you've got all of these companies that are attracted to cycling and, and they're the goal must be to try and attract more of these big companies. I think one of the things we were talking about earlier today was that if you have loose cannons like Oleg Tinkoff and to a lesser extent Andy Reese just firing off whatever they want, whenever they want, that's eventually going to discourage serious organisation from getting involved in cycling. And it's, it's very, very difficult for the UCI to stand up to people like Tinkoff because you know we saw the hand-wringing that... Um, followed, for instance, Belkin pulling out. Now, you know, the, the, the blame for that from some quarters was put at the door of the UCI. That, um, and yet, on the other hand, we expect the UCI to tell people like Oleg Tinkov, no, we don't want your money because you're too much of a troublemaker. It's all got very serious. Shall we yeah. return? Yeah, Gi- Gi- the rumour we heard tonight, Gian Shimano uh, might be the latest um, prey quarry for Fernando Alonso, the Formula 1 driver who has been threatening to set up a cycling team for a long time now but rumour that we heard today is that, that he might be taking over giant Shimano yeah I mean Alonso has suddenly come back to the fore in the last few days so uh, the chances of them setting up a team from scratch at this short notice unless they have been really putting in the work very very secretively and without any journalists finding out anything or riders or or riders exactly unless they've been incredibly secretive they can't set up a brand new world tour level team from scratch so the most sensible option would be to take over a team which already has a, a you know a bankable star marcel kittle absolutely and any other transfer gossip or anything like uh, Daniel? Have you you heard anything? No, I mean, on we um, we heard today that Tyler Farrar was going to sign for MTN Quebec, and then we put that to Brian Smith, who um, he will be the manager of that team only next year. He's sort of assembling that team's roster for next year, and he smiled or well, then shook his head. Well, very unconvincingly, I thought. Very, very unconvincingly. Well, they want to ride the tour, don't they? MTN yeah. Quebec next year. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought Tyler Farrar would get them in the tour, would he? But who knows? Ask. We would have to ask Prudy. I'm seeing Prudy on um, Christian Prudom on Tuesday at the Arctic race. I'm seeing Christian Prudom. <laughs> no, Daniel, you're going to the Arctic race, and Christian Prudom will be, be there. there. He is going to be there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I must afraid. admit, I'm allowed to say that. he's a friend I'm, of the podcast. I'm seeing Christian Prudom suggest that you're meeting him for a coffee or something. I must admit, MTN Quebec. I was very surprised they didn't get the wild card for the Tour de France this year yeah. because, in terms of you know the globalization and extending the Tour de France influence into Africa off the back of uh, Daryl Impey. I know we, you know, he's had his, uh, had his troubles with a, a positive test recently, but he was, uh, over the winter, you know, he was, uh, he worn the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. Chris Froome, of course, you know, British, but also African. I was surprised MTN Quebec didn't get an invite, and I would have thought the Tour would sort of breach that final kind of frontier at some point soon. Actually, Adrian Neon Schutte, Neon, Neon Schutte, is that how you pronounce his name? The Rwandan rider, I spoke to him after the race today and did an interview with him, which we'll play in a future podcast. Um, he has, he he's out of contract at the end of this year, he's had health problems and so on, but he was in the break in today's race and he's going to be back here for the Tour of Britain, he said. Um, but Brian Smith did say that he would be uh, offered a new contract for next year, so that's that's positive news. And as I say, we will play that interview at some point. Um, so shall we wrap it up there, chat? Well, hang on a minute. We've got, we've, let's look forward a little bit because we can hear from Matt White of Orica Green Edge. 
on Adam Yates making his debut God, you at the well. your back pocket, Lionel. Well, uh, Matt was packing up. They had to get to Gatwick quickly as well. Um, they had a hired van that they'd uh, presumably hired at Gatwick, driving it back to Gatwick, everyone flying out of there. Um, he explained why Adam Yates, who was on the start list for the Ride London Classic, he explained why Adam Yates didn't start. His brother Simon did start the race. Adam didn't. Adam is going to be making his Grand Tour debut at La Vuelta a España a little bit later this month. And uh, I asked Matt what he's expecting from Adam Yates in that race. Yeah, for the for people who don't know, he had a quite a big crash in the final of uh, San Sebastian. Uh, lucky actually to get away with it f- with the injuries he did. Uh, he had a bit of light concussion, but uh, what he, the main damage which kept him out of this weekend is he's sprained his thumb and um, was quite swollen. So. No rush, he's riding the welter in a couple of weeks' time and then he just wasn't right or confident on the bike with his uh, thumb in the situation it was to, to race today. You never really want to risk any rider who's, who's got a little niggle or an injury, but with a rider in his first year, and particularly having had such a good first year, even more important to give him a chance to recover so he's right for his first Grand Tour. Yeah, definitely. There's no need to push the kids. The kids, they're so motivated. Uh, the, the pressure is, comes from within, which is, a, which is a good way to be. And if anything, we've got to hold, the, hold some of our young guys back so what will you be looking for from Adam from the Vuelta? Stage wins. I think he's at a level that, uh, I know there's a very high level of climbing, climbers at the Vuelta, but uh, if you take yourself off general classification, it certainly does open up a few opportunities. So that's what we'll be looking for. And like, uh, like Simon, he won't be competing in the Vuelta. It'll be, I think, around the two-week two mark's ideal. And then he's finish off in, uh, finish off in Lombardy and Beijing. And do you think the selection for the Great Britain team for the World Championships, maybe, that course um, suits those kind of punchy, climby riders, doesn't it? Definitely does. Oh, they'd be mad if they didn't pay, pick him for the world. Both brothers. I think uh, if the British team qualified nine, they'd be, uh, they'd be about third or fourth guy in the team, I reckon. How difficult is it for guys like Simon? We saw him in the tour and, and we'll see Adam in the Vuelta. You know, they've got to first find their feet in Grand Tours. The, the style of racing is different. The intensity is a lot different, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I suppose for, for Simon at the, at, the, at the Tour de France, the stress of, of the Tour de France, just the crowds, the, uh, yeah, when you're basically on call from when you wake up in the morning to go to bed at night time, and that's, that's uh, a, little, a little bit different from under-23 racing. But, uh, yeah, the, it's the, the speed they climb, the level they've improved to this year, is, it's, a, it's very, very pleasing, very, very pleasing. But the, they were the best in the world last year at the under-23s, and they've just made that step quicker than most people would have thought. And lastly on Adam, um, getting into that final move with, in the company he was in San Sebastian. I mean, it, to see a young rider in his first year, winning the Tour of Turkey is one thing, but mm. being in the final of, that, of a race that hard, that's another level again, isn't it? It is. Look, he was staring down the barrel of a definite podium. So the podium, San Sebastian, uh, in your first year, he was... Look, if he'd made it, ridden a little bit more conservative, he might not have crashed, but he was going after Valverde. He'd already par- left the group he was in, he'd already passed Rodriguez. And he was after the win. He was hungry. Uh, and there was only one way to win, he thought, and that was to get Valverde back. And he just come a little bit, a bit unstuck. But, look, I'd rather be dealing with riders who we've got to pull back than to try to encourage. Well, that's somebody's car getting broken into in the background there. Matt, I'll let you get off to Gatwick. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Subscribe on iTunes. Listen on Audio Boo. Visit us at cyclingpodcast.com. So that was Matt White, the director of Orica Green Edge. We're going to wrap this up now in central London, where we're standing. And uh, the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, which has resumed today, will be carrying on in weekly format, uh, more frequently for big races, like perhaps the Tour of Britain, Tour of Spain. Um, that's to be confirmed, but we will be certainly, at a minimum, weekly. Uh, so Lionel, oh, and I should say actually before we do our goodbyes that you can find us on Twitter at cycling underscore podcast. We're also on Facebook and the website is thecyclingpodcast.com. So with all that, Lionel, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. And Daniel, Thanks. thank you. It's been emotional to see you guys again. Well, enjoy Norway. It was, it's going to be yeah. going to be great. What's the oh, weather I'm like there? Do a special report. I don't know what it's consist, going to consist of, but I'm going to do some kind of special Arctic Eskimo sort of. Is that is that politically incorrect? Mentioning Eskimos <laughs> is not politically incorrect. Okay. <laughs> Daniel, lo- looking forward to your special report. How, are you, have you had any thoughts about that? Have you been planning that already? No, no. Ice fishing, Sto- storyboarding. <laughs> No, I've no idea what it's going to consist of. It'll be good. I can promise. Well, I'll be taking that. inspiration from um, Lionel and his Adidas Gazelles Paris-Roubaix stage of the Tour de France because that went down very well with people. Seemed to. 
Yeah, that's something to look forward to, I think. I think so, Richard. I, for you, one, I'm looking forward to that. We're, we're going to be at the Tour of Britain, certainly the two of us. Maybe, Daniel, will you be there as well? I don't know whether... Welter, I think. Welter? Yeah. Oh, well, there we are. So, yeah. uh, the Tour Bet- of Britain... Between us, we'll knock out a few podcasts. Yeah, yeah. I think the Tour of Britain's on my... Um, yeah, and then possibly, towards the end of the season, I'm thinking of a trip to... Um, the uh, what do you call it? Parry tours. Parry tours. Going on, I'm, talking about, I'm going on holiday to Menorca <laughs> next week. <laughs> let's leave. I'm let's going around the tube to Green Park in, in yeah, five yeah, minutes. Yeah, let's let's wrap it up now. Goodbye, everybody. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast: interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered.